Um, I'll do a talk on a thing called Iron Small Talk, which is a small talk implementation on the .NET framework. Uh, it's a work in progress, as you learn. Um, uh, at the end of the day, well, a little bit of history, a little bit about the, what .NET is, especially the not the adaptive of the Dynamic Language Runtime, as uh, you see, and some implementation details will come in. And first, a little bit about the history of small talk, well, so you know, but uh, it started in 1980, uh, and it started as a research project uh, at, uh, at Xerox. So some people say, oh, this is a research prison. And um, we wanted to get out, and we finally got out in 1981, 20, 20 years ago. Uh, they published it, if you know, in, in the August version of uh, White Magazine. And then we are 30 years later here in Argentina. And what has happened with small talk in the meantime, or what has happened, but what is more interesting is what has happened with the rest of the world in the meantime. And a lot of other languages, as we heard in the keynote today, and then the uh, ESL languages, the Venice we came with everything else, and most of the other languages, they're playing with each other. And the question is, do we want to stay there in our balloon, or do we want to go and play with the other guys? And this is what my talk is about. This is also the reason I'm doing this uh, uh, version of uh, small talk. Yeah. And the talk today will be based on two things. Very, very simple. But now, what this is how works. Uh, and the second is a little bit, well, based on very simple. I have a class called Greeter, which will uh, greet people or somebody else. Um, and the reason we have these classes, it has some very, very complex logic, which we do not want to re implement it, very difficult to re implement our language. And we like to use this logic. In this case, it's a little bit naive, but. Example is example, definitely simple. Uh, and it's basically says good evening, good morning, etc., and time of day, and whoever you are supposed to read. Uh, and those will be the two examples that the rest of the demonstration is based on. So now I uh, mentioned the motivation why we are doing this, um, and a little bit about myself. I've been doing small talk since 1988, not well, 13 years. Sharper than other uh, people. I work with business applications, so I'm not coming from research background, etc. Uh, and I play mostly with the Microsoft.net. I'm not a coffee drinker. That's <laughs> 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 what I mean. Um, and there's also the issue between something that costs and something that's free. And I'm not sure that you can charge for something that people see today as a foundation. Most other companies, the is for free, the is for free. And I also think we would have. Not the small implementation on this for free. That's why it's under MIT license. I think it's commodity actually. Uh, so the goal of this project was to implement XTJ20. This is the ANSI standard for Plan Small Talk. Uh, and it's the other goal is it should be first class member of the DLR family, which means that it should be equally good languages as Iron Python and Iron Ruby and maybe even C sharp. Uh, they should have easy interrupt with the .NET. Uh, because they have a huge class that I really want to use, and it has decent performance. It doesn't have to be number one, but decent performance. And it has a little bit of personal challenge for me to learn to start, etc. So, a little bit of Microsoft.net. I guess most of you know what it is, but basically, it's a framework where you can get a lot of uh, different languages and they compile up to a thing called common language runtime. So, this thing is common for all other languages. They can run different languages, there are more languages here. Well, they figured out, okay, this is for static language, why well, don't we need similar things for dynamic language? And they created recently, I think called DLR, which is dynamic language like that. And it has a lot of components, I'll talk a little bit about them later, but basically it says there are, and for some reason there are different irons, so this model is called iron model as well, and different languages here that build on top of this. So you don't have to review the whole framework, like you can reuse what we know what would be the virtual machine. And we do this in some small talk. For example, James Dunn has about uh, the Ruby and Flash uh, for small talk right now. Uh, and the DLR is the playground. So this is where the languages can play and communicate with each other. And, and Microsoft provides the toys. This is what the DLR is. And we want to be there, we want to play with the other toys. Um, so, so, so the DLR are those components that we need to, to build our languages and also to communicate with the other languages because. As I told you earlier, it's very boring being alone. You want to be there with the other guys. Uh, 
So what's important about small talk and what really makes small talk a small talk and how do you communicate with that language? Well, obviously, it's a message set. Uh, and this is communicating between objects. And this is what we need to understand and what we need to master in their environment. So uh, the very, very simple example here is a topic of Sanskrit show the world. Well, to be able to work, we need to somehow generalize this. If you uh, notice the first talk, mentioned one thing today. If we can have the language um, representation dynamics, we can actually manipulate uh, the language itself from within the language. Well, let's see if we can do this actually. Get some script show in our world. Uh, well, what, what this will do, it will go somewhere. This example is from uh, Faro. It will go and find a thing called Sensory Street. Street and there is an implementation of the method. Uh, so what we need to do is figure out is okay, uh, this Sanskrit show, you know, on science, where is the implementation and how we do it, how do we execute the, the implementation itself. Uh, so the thing is to start to generalize this into some more um, well I will use the word hard coded objects fewer objects and fewer um, things that we can actually manipulate there. So the thing is, we can rewrite this and put something like this message we see on transcript, so that the show arguments in our world and evaluate the message. This will do exactly the same thing. But the thing is now, for this thing, we have an object. And since we have an object, we can do stuff on top of this. And uh, the thing, uh, the, the term that they use for this is a call site, because this is where the call happens. This, if you, if you done a little bit of uh, dynamic languages, comes again and again. So we're not using the term message, we to use the term call site for every time we have a message sent. Yeah. And there's a little bit difference that in the previous example, if this was to go back, uh, we had a selector here and the arguments in the receiver. We pulled out the receiver because the receiver is also a type of argument. So what we have here is the call site which has the static part, which is the, uh, the selector itself, which will never change. We have a positive can change is the receiver and the arguments. And we can evaluate. So evaluate with the receiver and the arguments. Um, so now we have this um, object. We can go a step further and say, well, okay, what happens when we uh, invoke this method? Well, we basically have to go and somehow, somehow find where the show method is for the transcript. And they say, okay, well, call site is something generic. Uh, we can abstract a step further and say, well, there's an object uh, called binder. So the call site has a binder object. And the binder object is the one that actually gets to do the work. This is the one that has to somehow figure out how to do this operation with this receiver. So uh, this thing here, this is provided by Microsoft, but we have to provide a binder for small talk. Um, and binder has, uh, by the way, it's obviously written in .NET, but uh, the examples here are in uh, small talk syntax, so it's easier for us to understand. Uh, it has a method that says bind for a receiver and the arguments. And small talk is for us very easy because in small talk we don't care about the arguments. The only thing that changes uh, for us uh, and it can uh, result in different method implementations to the receiver because we have polymorphic. And, but the only thing that, that it has sequence on the polymorphic account is the receiver. Small talk arguments are, do not have any difference on, on the method. This doesn't have languages, by the way. And uh, the binary could do something stupid like this binary rule and go and look up the methods. Very easy. Uh, but, uh, in real dynamic language, you want it to be more, more dynamic. So uh, instead of having a class definition here, like uh, receiver compartment that, uh, or actually, it was probably the receiver class compartment that, you can go and ask the object, can you help me perform this operation? And this is really, really dynamic because uh, we don't use this in small code, but some other JavaScript does that other language does. And we could do the same. You, you're going to, uh, you're going to ask the binder for a specific <coughs> object. I would like to perform this operation on this object. And this most probably uh, will end up um, somehow into the object itself. Uh, let me see here. So it makes sense in this case to ask the object, can you help me perform the show method? Um, and this is what we do. 
we go to the object and say we want uh, help from this operation uh, and operate itself uh, the object. And the object here in this case will say, well, um, naive implementation. We say self compile method and find a selector. So, so this will return the compile method for, for the operation we want to do. Um, but what happens is if the object can't help you? Because not all objects that are intelligent, they are also stupid objects. Especially when you work in this heterogeneous world, where you have booleans, etc., that come from the net world, and they're not your own object, then you have a thing called fallback. So if you accidentally get a dot net boolean, this is not a real object. You'll go and ask it, can you perform the operation if true? It's a true file, I don't know what it is. Then you fall back. And then you figure out, say, oh no, it's a boolean object. Here is the if true method for for the uh, for true or for false. Uh, so in this way, this gives us opportunity to add our own methods to objects that do not know how to perform an operation. And this is a very good thing because when you get an object not coming from Smalltalk but from .NET, from Python, or from Ruby, or from somebody else, you want to, to be able to extend the class here. Something that we are very used to in Smalltalk. Uh, <coughs> So we first ask the object, can you do the operation? If not, we come back and say, okay, we know this is a Ruby object and you know, we want all those methods in there. Um, so somehow the development tools will have to help you add those methods. And this is what <coughs> I'm doing. And of course, it returns some binding program. Uh, and this is the division of responsibility between the small talk and the implementer of the objects. Um, so I'll do a very, very simple uh, and naive demo here. Behind the and, and 
few uh, modern logic with expression objects. And this is an example of uh, the fact of this. So the binder from, uh, from the previous example, instead of returning you the, the, the compound, which there is not such a thing in the TLR, I just need to start somewhere. It actually has to return an expression uh, object, which tells you how to execute the stuff. And uh, the parameters itself, they are objects as well. So, so the, the, the G compiler will know how to compile this into machine code. But you don't you give it machine code, you give it very high level objects. So this compound method that will be something like uh, binding group expression and there is a dynamic uh, expression which means you have to perform a dynamic call on this object. And then for this dynamic expression you give it uh, some arguments and the DLR knows how to perform the call when it comes uh, there. And I'll do the other demo here which is a little bit more interesting. Um, I wrote It says good evening for Cyrus and the reason it says good evening is because my laptop is still running on a European time. <laughs> but it works. What does that mean? Well very stupid thing, but it, but the thing about this that makes it interesting is how it is used. So it gets 
compiled several times on, on the web, actually, yeah. Uh, and the good thing is, the, the blue stuff here is Microsoft stuff, they will take care of it. Um, the orange, this is ARM's model, this is the one that we have to maintain. And the good thing is they have resources to have uh, chip compilers for different platforms, <coughs> to optimize this stuff, to make it for bits of code, Unicode support, all the things that you need, multi ready. You don't have to care about this, you get it for, for, for free. The only problem is that if you have to run this logic every single time, it will be expensive. So you need to do some caching. This is a thing called polymorphic inline cache. Don't forget the logic once you figure out how to execute. What's the logic for certain methods? So in this case, uh, if we, if we do, if we execute this line several times, the first part has to be done only once, once we create the call side. And the next time we execute this, we only have to perform the second part. So obviously, we optimize some things. And this guy, before, because it is an object, it's clever, and it can become clever, it can catch some things. Um, Yes. So, so first time we execute, we need to figure out what is the logic for the show method, and the, 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 the process of binding this to a specific operation. And this could be expensive, so let's not forget this. Uh, and this, this binding is returned as an object that is a thing called binding rule. And because it's an object, you can just put it into an instance variable and install uh, the implementation. So next time we run this, we already have the implementation. They have just compiled this machine code and just adjust to some memory instruction and it runs. The only thing is, what if the implementation changes depending on the receiver? So, with the expression here in the binding rule, we give it a restriction and say this implementation, this specific implementation, is only valid as long as the receiver fulfills certain <coughs> conditions. And because it's model is simple. As long as the class of the object is transcript string. So next time it's executed, it does first this check. Is the class of the object transcript string? If it does, oh, we get the implementation jump. We run. If not, go back. And figure out what's the correct implementation for this specific, this specific receiver. And cache? Of course. <laughs> Otherwise, it, it will be. Uh, <laughs> Exactly, caching. Otherwise, it, it will be uh, slow. Um, and the restrictions can be more complex. They don't have to be on class, they can be more complex. And in Smalltalk, we don't have this, except with very few restrictions. There are few places where we do want the restrictions to get more things. Um, one is the Booleans, because the does not have a concept of two and four. They have a, a, a one class called Booleans, and we do have to distinguish between those two. The other one where we can actually do some specific caching is for perform. Because the, the argument of the perform the selector, uh, if we cache, cache this with the selector, next time the call side gets called with the same selector, we know we don't have to do the loop after the perform and just <coughs> perform it directly. So there are a few things where and the loudness then is one of the other where we can do some more tricky uh, restrictions. But the restrictions are the complex and we can we can also do uh, restrictions that are instance specific. Not only on the class of the objects, but the restrictions determine the polymorphism of the objects, and they are the key to this polymorphism in cache. If they are badly implemented, the coding will be slow. And caching has that three level of caching, as a thing called level zero. It's not that level, so they start with zero. It's the rule for the last call, very fast, one thing. Then level one is the last ten rules that were hit in this cache. And level two is the last hundred rules that were hit for this particular thing. But the last hundred are shared between similar sites. So all the places where you have, uh, for example, a string, they can share the same uh, call site cache. Because if you have a string here and a string here, the chances that this will be the same as if it's not so you can share the cache. But it's more complex than you want to uh, speak. <coughs> and back to the overview. Uh, so they provide you uh, with a lot of the framework. So they provide you the, the caching, dynamic object, expression trees. What you have to implement is a binder. You have to implement an object which knows how to resolve an operation with a logic. And then you have to implement your own uh, language and Well, 
anti-myelopenes, but this is the basic idea. And once you get the binder, you can talk from, 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 for example, from C-sharp, the Ruby binder to the Arms Corporate binder, etc. So you can cross the mismatch, this is the two ones. And the, the DLR is you know, the layer in the middle that makes this communication possible. Um, so not to be boring, I'll try to do another demo. So there are some components involved in this 
we have a small compiler, uh, the definition starts, we can create a classes, some other stuff, a runtime, a car, and, and this is total data object, so they have to be hosted somehow, somehow you need to start it, and one of them is the, the compile utility, uh, the, the command line utility. Otherwise is to uh, inline it into your uh, Silverlight project or whatever you want. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, distinction because the small code runtime is basically an image, so we need to instantiate an image every time you need it. And you can have several in there. And this is very important because people, if you work with business application, they are talking about multi-tenancy. They want to run several users' um, environments inside the same physical web server. And the dev has a thing called an app domain where they isolate it and they can put the security. But sometimes you want actually want to run several multi-tenant applications inside the same uh, web process or something. And that's why you instantiate an image for everything, for every logic you want, and to run your copy in there. Um, there are some things that are specific symbols. Symbols are actually not very used in, in our talk. Symbols are used if you want to do identity checks. For, for faster comparisons between strings, but once you have a remote cache, it's not that really important. Uh, strings are a little bit of tricky because strings in the data are immutable, we need immutable strings, so we have two types of strings. Small talk processes, um, they have not such a thing. You can look at thread, so if you need a, a thing that runs parallel, just start with thread and run it there. There's no such a thing as sender. Uh, it's difficult to implement. Response to it's slightly difficult, it's a different way of implementing because you just can't just ask the class if this class implements a method. You actually have to ask uh, the object itself because the object could be from another language which uh, has an instance-specific behavior, for example, JavaScript. We do not have uh, control of object space meaning that it's there with the dead objects and it has other solutions. We can't do object space detections, which means we can't do all instances or references. We cannot do VCAM. But what we can do is something called behave like, which means we can exchange the behavior of an object, but we cannot actually, uh, change its name. And it maybe makes sense because if, if, if we have a Ruby object, Ruby will be very angry if it just became its object to something else. So it maybe makes sense for our objects, but not for our other people. And I understand this. There are some things about it because some people might have seen this uh, organization diagram. Well, Microsoft did this thing, unfortunately, it's true. It's not an organization that's not always covered with each other. So, no one knows what the future of this thing is. But we call that they use it. They, they are planning to use it for a lot of stuff in the bed and it's uh, built into the bed. Good news is Unicorn. I mean, if you're interested, it's 
costs and if more people want to work on the projects, uh, it's, it's a good thing. I don't know, it's, 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 it's open for, for discussion and for, for change. The thing is, the, my goal is to see if it was possible to create this on top of the DLR and have the, 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 the NCC specification running. And I believe it is. I've done about 60% of the specification. I have an idea how to implement the rest. So we have to do it So uh, another question is about performance. Because uh, you have the remote like cache, uh, but um, anyway, there are several steps in the middle of the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think that the um, I haven't done a lot of performance tests yet. Obviously, the startup is will be a little bit more expensive because the logic is, is uh, more complex. But the execution uh, is not necessarily more complex because the, the next steps, uh, the, 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 especially the native tool compiled for Microsoft, is very aggressive. The guys they have uh, resources and they can optimize a lot of stuff. I did one one specific test is the um, factorial. And for example, 3000 factorial, and I also only have one reference, this is VSC Visual Small Talk, it takes about 4 seconds, and this takes about 5 milliseconds here. So, but this is because probably it ends up in primitive, and the large integer in VSC is complete crap. Um, but it's decent. And it's, it's not perfect, but it's decent. And if you make your rules, the thing that can kill the model cache, if the, if, if if the rules change, if, if, if a specific logic is valid for this receiver, if their contacts are badly implemented, then it will be stopped. But otherwise, I think it's quite uh, optimized. Another, another way to explore is the new Rosalind. The Rosalind features of C Sharp 5, the dynamic compiler. They are moving, they are moving more and more into the dynamic stuff. So this is good for us. What did you do, Smart What do you think? Why did you think it was necessary to do Smart because, because I'm here, Smart Talk is dead, Smart Talk is dead, uh, we are not there, we are not on the other platform, I think it's a, we are not dead, we are alive. Uh, and I wanted to prove that it's possible. It was personal challenge. And I like to see us as first class player 